All right, we're back. Fourth edition of the MMCAA season recaps, 2022-2023. We've got the longtime coverage here for UMD Bulldogs. Max Shout Veach. Out. Veach, how we doing? I, I'm doing well. I had to make sure I've got the Hull jersey up, the Bulldog sweatshirt on, the maroon hat, the Bulldogs logo, and the, the shout out Wego, the Wego hat with the Bulldog on it as well. Just in case anybody was confused who we're talking about, you shouldn't be anymore. So if you're watching on YouTube, it was evident from the second this, start, this started. So happy to be here. There we go. And I mean, you being in a unique position where your team is basically, I'm not even going to hold back from it. They're in the Mecca of beer for the state of Minnesota. Duluth is just such a great oasis for incredible craft beer. And some of them kind of tip the hat to being on Lake Superior, being part of that. Who cares? Use the tools that you're given. But let's just kick off here because we both got a couple of Duluth delicacies. Um, Leading off with Ursa Minor. What are you drinking? Uh, I've got their Constellation Cream Ale. Um, Everybody knows that there is a cream ale up the shore a little bit, two harbors uh, at Castle Danger. That is a great beer and widely renowned and readily available many, many places. Um, And I love that one as well. Uh, When I'm in Duluth and I want a cream ale, this is the one I go to. I would say it rivals that in every single facet, and it is phenomenal. Uh, 10 out of 10, in my opinion, if this is what you're looking to drink and what you like. Wow. And so is that, though, just because you're like not looking to make the drive up to Castle Danger and you just want what's close and easy? Or if you were handed both, like which one would you drink? Uh, I drink both of them. As, as selfish <laughs> as that sounds, I'm drinking both of those beers. I have nothing against either of them, and I love them both equally. But this has been my go-to more often than not, just because it has wow. been a little bit tougher to make that drive up the shore. But if I'm going up there, I make the stop 10 times out of 10, too. So that's huh. it is what it is. Well, Isha's going to love that. Isha about pissed himself when we went up and recorded at Castle Danger. So uh, I will give him that tip. I'm sure. rocking the uh, Galactic Face Slap, which is just a great name, but a beautiful can here as well from, again, Ursa Minor Brewing. Um Man, I don't know. They, I think they're awesome. Uh, great proximity as well to Bent Paddle. Makes it pretty easy to go between the two. Plus, my wife likes ciders, so got a couple of those to mix in. Yep. Um, but Ursa Minor, just such a, a cool tap room. I haven't really had any misses there as far as the beer is concerned. Right. And the, the Bear Hopcomb logo is pretty uh, pretty epic. Yep. So fun fact, if you haven't been there in a while, um, from what I've heard, because I've got all my stuff um, from from secondary distributors as well, but they did take all of their stills and equipment out of that facility where their tap room was, and they're just expanding the tap room and they're moving brewing operations elsewhere. So what was a small, cozy, but still great environment in there is going to be bigger, more open and a lot more space there too. So only good things coming out of there and this rebrand that they did. Um, where all the cans basically are the same. You just have a different color and obviously the label on there is a little bit different. Uh, I didn't know how I felt about it at first because I do like a little bit of variety in the label. It shows, you know, how much fun you can have. It gives a little bit more artistic design, but I kind of love it now. Like I've I've gotten used to it and I I like it a lot. It's clean. It's simple. It's never going to be the one that's necessarily going to grab someone's eyes and be like, whoa, what the hell is this? But like it, I don't know. I think it looks nice. Yep. Agreed. Beautiful. Well, not a great transition because I, I don't know how you're going to feel about this. Speaking looks nice, but give me a letter grade on the season here. Like expectations going into the season. What do you give for a final grade for the UMD Bulldogs this year? Okay. So there's a lot that goes into it and I'm going to try and be as, as succinct as possible. Um, UMD overachieved last year in the postseason and at the end of the year. So they were essentially fighting to be a 500 team. Um, They ultimately did make it above 500 thanks to a couple of late wins there, made it into the play or the, um, you know, the the playoffs there after winning the frozen face off in the NCHC. And they were, you know, one bad bounce away from making it back to another frozen four. So a lot of that had to do with a really hot goaltender and some overperforming um, defensive play. And, you know, I will admit maybe a, a bit of a favorable call against Michigan Tech in that opening game. That being said, um, 
I will fall back on. They, they, they overperformed what I think they had from a talent standpoint at the end of the year there. And that's not to say they didn't underperform at other points in the year too, but um, to expect them to make it back to that with 10, I think, freshmen coming in this year is, is crazy. Now, I did not expect as many of the surprising losses as we saw this year as well. And there was quite a few people that, that struggled more than I thought they would based on their pedigree and you know the hype coming into the year. Um, but I'm not as down as some other people are. I, I, I would give them a C plus because this is largely a, a freshman team um, that is undersized playing in the most physical, <laughs> physical conference in college hockey. And a lot of times they, they still held their own and they showed that they could beat the best teams. They had a couple of top five wins. Uh, they beat the top team in the country when it was St. Cloud state that swept them that weekend. And so they were just inconsistent. So C plus it, it wasn't as bad as some people are making it out to be, but it certainly wasn't as good as they could have been as well. When you talk about how young and how small they are in such a gritty conference yet. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like every time I check Twitter, all Max Veach was talking about was how penalized the Bulldogs were. And that was part of it. Like <laughs> I'll bring it up right now. I know we're going to talk about some, some highlights and lowlights from the season, but uh, one of them is, is certainly that Wisconsin series. I mean, we saw tempers flare for both um, Wyatt Kaiser and Isaac Howard, both getting ejections and it, it just came to a boiling point very, very early. And that kind of continued throughout the season. There was a lot of, you know, blame game going around maybe not in the locker room but it certainly felt like it on the ice there or there's people just mad at themselves for not being able to perform like they were at the you know junior levels or at the u.s or under 18 team or wherever they were playing before and that just kind of came out a lot um there were a couple of dumb penalties in there as well it wasn't always just you know <laughs> fighting or or getting a, a slashing or a cross check to the face mask but um, they, they found themselves in the box and as good as their power play was, their penalty kill was as this whole season was shaky at, at best. And um, it's not what they're used to. It's not like they were able to clog everything up like they've been used to in the past, like Scott Sandlin's system has done for, you know, over a decade. Um, they were struggling to figure it out at, uh, for, for quite a bit this year. And um, it, it certainly showed on the score sheet. Fair. Well, let's transition then. I mean, any other big moments, right? Good or bad, like that stood out for you throughout the year. Like if you're, if you're going to do the spark notes, right? Like what do people need to know about this season? Um, man, I, I want to say that it, it was good at home, but it wasn't always good at home. Like the Wisconsin series, for example, terrible. And everybody brought it up throughout the year. They referenced that one as one of the reasons they were ranked so low. And it's it's totally factual because Wisconsin was so low in the pairwise rankings. Those losses to those quote unquote bad teams do way more harm than wins against good teams do. Because, you know, you saw them, like I said, sweep the number one team in the country at the time, St. Cloud State, and they only jumped two or three spots that that weekend and it was a dominating dominating weekend um they played denver to two overtime games in the first series in that one and that didn't move them up or down at all so even though they only they came away with two points we'll say that's the same as an overtime victory um it's it didn't do anything for them it didn't necessarily hurt them either even though there were two losses but it did nothing for them to show that they could play with another top five team they played denver later in the year and won one of those games and i think they only moved up one spot that time if i'm remembering right but um, those I would say were highlights because you saw the, the guys that needed to come out and play. You saw, um, you know, some of these younger guys, Ben Steves, who we'll talk about later, uh, shine in, in, the, on the power play natural hat trick for what felt like the first time since I've been watching UMD, maybe not ever, but in a very, very long time. And it was very fun to watch. Those were fun games. And there were some not so fun games, like when they get, shut out with 50 shots against Ludwig person, or I'm trying to think of Emberico, I think shut him out twice as well. Those were not fun games. They, they were getting shots, not necessarily great shots, but they just couldn't get anything going in those ones. And those are the ones that stand out the most to me. I'm not going to say a couple of other times where they lost to these other Minnesota teams, because we might have some um, co-hosts listening and I'm not going to give them the satisfaction or gratitude of mentioning them by name. Uh, but we know who those are. And um, yeah, those, those were the highlights and lowlights specifically for me that, that stood out the most this year. Okay. Fair. Well, let, let's talk then specific players. Like 
who surprised, who overperformed, who underperformed, like who was just catching your eye, good or bad? Yeah, okay. The easy one I just mentioned. Ben Steves, as a freshman, comes in and scores 21 goals. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure it was the most as a freshman, second to only Brett Hall, who's hanging up in the closet here. Like, that's pretty good company to be in there. And, you know, it's not like he was flying under the radar. He had a pretty good pedigree coming in, but it wasn't as high as some of these other guys that were on the team that didn't have the same success as him. And um, I don't want to say it's all due to the line that he was on, but he had a lot of, of really good help, but he made a lot of his own luck out there as well. And as a smaller guy, freshman coming into a bigger league, it's pretty tough to find those shots. And so finding himself in the right position, kind of, you know, it's better to be lucky than it is good, but it's better to be prepared so you can be lucky, which makes you good. So um, I would say Ben Steve's easy one that overperformed. Um, as far as underperformed, and it's going to sound like I'm a, a salty fan here, but I promise it's not, um, Isaac Howard. I mean, he, he came in as a first-round draft pick for Tampa Bay. Everybody thought that he was going to solve UMD's scoring problems, and that's admittedly, hand up, a lot to put on a, a freshman in this conference, in UMD's playing style, it, it, it's tough. Like, I understand all of that is probably more than we should have put on the kid, but I don't know that he lived up to what any sort of lower or, you know, more acceptable expectations would have been either. And I, th I think he would say that as well. Being suspended for two games didn't help that um, and, and, you know, kind of hurt the development there a little bit, hurt the trust from the team and everything else too. Um, but the play style, I think, was the the largest factor there, and that that played into why he ended up, you know, decom or not decommitting, why he ended up going into the transfer portal and making his way over to um, Michigan State this year, uh, because he is familiar with the coach. He likes the play style over there. It's Big Ten hockey, so you get a lot more uh, offensive focused uh, rushes both ways, and he's, you know, not that he's looking out uh, or looking away looking to get away from or get out of being a defensive player, but his strengths are on offense. Like he is an offensive minded shooter first mentality. And so um, being able to play that style, I think is going to work out for him. And I wish the best for him. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be great to see him develop there as well. But I think for UMD this past year, he would be an, an easy one that I would say was on the, you know, below expectations that were set at the beginning of the year. And again, he had, he had a tough start to the year and he had a good finish. Like if his second half was the entire year, I think we could be having a different conversation here and maybe that success would make him want to stay as well. I don't know that that's a lot of conjecture, but something that I, I, I thought was, you know, worth bringing up here. Um, I mean, I got, it, but but to that point, right, if you end the season on a high note, aren't you more inclined like, oh, this is what it'll be like next year. So I don't true. know, maybe it wouldn't have made a difference. Maybe it was just, hey, I don't want to be in Duluth, Minnesota or, hey, Could this be. coach doesn't mesh with what I want. And I know I got my boy over at Michigan State, like you said. But so point blank, then when he's playing for Tampa at some point, assuming they don't ship him off as part of like a seven pick package for Tanner Janot. Are, yeah. are you cheering for or against or indifferent? I mean, whether he wants to or will, uh, you know, embrace it or not, he's he's a UMD alum. I, I don't care. If you play for a year, you're a UMD alum. I will have a, a small part of me rooting for him unless he gets traded to Colorado or Chicago. Then, you know, that kind of fades a little bit. But, you Those know, are the, the second top two, I, huh? Those are the top two. The, the, the second I say that, I'm thinking, well, I was just hyping up Wyatt Kaiser in a Blackhawks jersey, and Alex Stalock looked pretty good between the pipes there as well. So we cheer pretty, for Alex Stalock everywhere. Yeah, pretty tough for me to to stand by that. Um, so I take everything I just said back. It doesn't matter where he plays. I'm going to root for him a, a little bit. One fourth of what I would root for any of these other guys, just because that's what I expect them to play. But, you know, Kaiser, that, there's, there's another guy um, that – I don't know that he was above or below expectations. He was right at what everybody expected him to be, but those expectations were high. And, you know, that's not to say that he may have performed or thought that he, or he was trying to do too much some nights because I think he felt like he needed to be a spark plug for the offense as a defensive player. But I mean, he was a lockdown defender and NHL ready as it showed when he made his way to the NHL, the second the Bulldogs were done. Um, well, so tell me, though, with him, yeah. right, is it that, like, Chicago's desperate and they 
talked him into coming or like do you feel like he kind of capped out the experience he could gain playing in that conference so i think there's a lot that goes into it i i I personally, again, pretty selfishly think that he would have benefited a little bit more from staying, getting that extra time to grow before you go into the NHL, especially as a defender where you have a little bit more mass to throw around. Um, That being said, going to Chicago where one of the assistant coaches was an assistant coach at UMD, you've got people in the front office who are UMD alum that you're familiar with. You're You know, you've got Alex Stalock there, who is somebody you can kind of maybe not commiserate with, but have an immediate connection with. Like, there's so much familiarity there that it's pretty easy to get comfortable pretty quick. Add on top of that, that Chicago had just had a fire sale and emptied their roster. And he's got a a wide open path to getting immediate playing time. I can see how it's very attractive. I mean, it's it's the exact opposite of, and I brought this up before on this podcast and others, it's the exact opposite of, you know, that same organization in the Blackhawks and their pick of Hobie Baker winner, Drew LeBlanc. And, you know, shout out Hermantown. Again, I'm going to bring it up as many times as I can. But Shocking. Yeah, I mean, he was drafted <laughs> and, you know, brought into that program in the middle of their dynasty. And there's just not room for a Hobie Baker winner on your roster. It's crazy. So, when you have an opportunity to to join a team, regardless of what their their status is, um, to play in the NHL and kind of cement yourself and and get some tape that other people are going to look at a little bit easier, I I think you you have to take it and you can't fault a guy for doing it. Yeah, no, it's not a matter of faulting. I mean, based on your response there, then being that Kaiser was a sophomore and you thought there was still more to be gained, I have to imagine then you're in the camp that Logan Cooley should be returning to the Gophers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would do him well to return to the Gophers. He's going to, what, what's he going to do? Go play in another college arena? Like what's the difference really? Like, well, and, and they didn't buy out the, you know, give him the burn year. So like, what's the point in going at this point? Right. Right. Exactly. So I, I, I would say. That jersey's going to be beautiful though. I will buy it the second he signs. And I, I know. know what number he is. If I knew for sure what number he'd be, I'd already have it. But You'd, you'd pre-order. Yeah. Oh yeah. For uh, sure. I, I do think he would uh, benefit from from staying another year, and you know, <laughs> if he has another year like he did this year, when do you start to consider? Oh, I can go for some point records. Maybe not at Minnesota. Maybe not overall. But like, you're you're starting to to consider like, well, I'm going to be in history books here if I if I stick around even one more year. And it's, it's a tough sell when you've got that NHL talent that's, you know, mm-hmm. ready to be going and maybe at a franchise that, again, has some some openings immediately for you. But um, that those are the conversations that are happening behind closed doors. And it's a lot easier for some guys than it is for others. And it's really, really enticing to go, you know, play in the, the National League as soon as you can. But for him, at least one more, I think, would, would be good. I'm not going to be heartbroken. He's, he's 18. He's 18. And yes. literally, the guy that coerced him to leave Notre Dame and go to the Gophers has already announced twice, apparently, because St. Louis writers decide that they want to reannounce what's already been announced. Jimmy's back. Yep. Logan's got to be back with him. They, they're going to be boys. They're going to shred up the ice and Dinky Town. Yep. Fingers crossed, man. And, you know, it's going to be another one of those things that there was arguably two gophers that were left out of the Heisman conversation at the end of the year. The, the, uh, or sorry, the Heisman and watching football, the whole Hobie, <laughs> hat, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the Hobie hat trick. Um, and so that's crazy because there was already two in there. So I think that we could see a, a repeat in terms of two gophers in the Hobie hat trick next year as well. And the two that you mentioned are one a and one B, uh, but that's not to say they don't have some, some really, really high end talent coming in as well, but, sure. but yeah, back, back off of the Gophers. I just had, yeah, to go we're, off we're talking of the Kaiser comment, had to go off it with the Kaiser comment. No, I know. I know. And, and, and you know, while, while we're talking, about. yeah, while we're talking individuals, um, uh, another guy that I, I maybe again, un, unjust or whatever, I had higher expectations for on the year. Um, Derek Dashke, he he came in as a transfer portal guy that was a captain from another NCHC team. He was brought in to be an offensive defenseman to kind of captain that power play. And after the first the first weekend, he scored game winning goal against Arizona State. It looked like it was working to perfection. Everything was on track. Um, but at, at end of the year, I think he finished with 
five goals and you know he he wasn't too too far down on the umd points list but that's that's not saying too much because umd wasn't too high up on the national points list either uh, mm-hmm. so I, I think what we were expecting out of him in terms of an offensive player as a defenseman just didn't end up panning out this year and again a lot of that may have to do with playing in a different role than he was used to and playing with smaller players and just you know playing from behind a lot that you don't have the opportunity to kind of control that puck. So um, that was another one that maybe not as bad as I'm I'm making it sound, but certainly slightly below where the expectations were at the beginning of the year. Sure. So let's talk departures then, because you already mentioned Howard, you already mentioned Kaiser. And with this team being as young as it is, you wouldn't expect too many. Anyone I'm missing, like anyone noteworthy that will be departing the program? Um, So the guys that aged out, um, Ladroot captain uh that's a a tough loss not that he was at the top of the list for any of these scoring titles or anything either but always tough to see the leadership change um and you know he's he's a good guy i i I liked him a lot um jesse jacks another one the same fits that same mold he was a locker room guy kind of held everybody together um tough to see that one go um luke milmock um overtime hero is is leaving uh to go to niagara don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure 94% sure on, on that uh, transfer portal out. Um, so him and Isaac Howard are the two transfer portals that are, are coming to mind right now as the only two. And then you've got Kaiser and Dashke. Dashke aged out, Kaiser going to the NHL. But outside of that, most most everybody else is, is staying, as far as I'm aware. Again, fingers crossed, uh, I could be missing somebody or, or just not be, be up to date as, as I thought I was here. Um but that's that's what's on my list right now. And are there any massive departures compared to what I thought was going to be there outside of Isaac Howard? Probably not. Um, it's not as bad as it was last year, we'll say. So uh, last year, as far as the offense going going into this past year, Noah Cates, Kobe Roth, Kobe Bender, and Casey Gilling all gone. And those were all older upperclassmen, relatively high points guys. I mean, that's I not that heard as losing. much as uh, go for it. Yeah, I don't I don't know that we're losing as much as we did last year going into this year as we are this year going into next year. And again, it's not saying so much based on UMD not scoring as many points, but the fact that we don't have to reset as much. These 10 freshmen that were here this year are now going to be sophomores. And we can kind of build as a team, as a whole, you know, it's going to be a monster here. Maybe not next year. I think they will take a step forward. But the year after that, when we've got 12 juniors on the team, probably, who knows how many of them are staying at that point or the transfer portals around, whatever. But it's it's building to be something that's that's going to be a lot more than it was this year, for sure. Okay. Well, and, and beer check real quick, because I've already uh, capped my Ursa Minor beer, and I'm going to be opening the other one after this topic, so... Whether you want to bounce around or just I'll bounce around. Dummy that guy. Let's yeah. uh let's flip though to the positive. Let's talk about guys that you expect to be coming in and joining the program this year. Uh yeah. So this is this is exciting for me. Uh again, shout out Hermantown. And it's exciting for you as a Pittsburgh Penguins fan. Uh Zam Plant coming in. Um he, he's spent some time in Chicago Steel, ended up getting traded to the Fargo Force, where he's playing with another Bulldog, Anthony Mangini. Both of them helped them win the regular season trophy. I don't know what it's called down there, but um, suffice it to say, they're they're doing good things, and I, I think both of them will come in with the same kind of expectations that we saw from some of the freshmen this year. And you know, fingers crossed, we see a little bit more output from these guys as well. But I'm not going to be the one to put the pressure on them. I just hope that they are finding a spot and developing as quickly as possible there. Um, and then the other well, one. So, on the so offense, don't stop on that one then Veach. Like, yeah. To that point, where is the right spot for him? Like ideally, at least to start the year, where is he in the lineup to succeed? Um, He'll be a third line guy to start. I, I don't think he's going to be on the fourth pair. He's not going to be throwing bodies around. He is going to be put in those, those chances. And I, I could see him being, depending on how he does in the first couple of weeks, I could see him being mixed in on the second line of a power play as well, because he's another one of those guys that just finds himself in the right spot to score or, you know, more, more aptly he's, he's finding the way to push the puck to these other scorers. And this is a, a 
you know, perfect scenario in my mind is if you're able to find them on the, the same line as a, a Ben Steves or even a Cole Spicer, who is a, another guy that came in this year. Um, I think they would meld and mesh pretty well, pretty quickly, just because they seem like the similar type of players that Zam has played with in high school. And from the, you know, three or four games I ended up watching when he was still in Chicago on those teams as well. Um, he's just got the eyes and the patience and, a good mentality and coming, you know, as a son of Derek plant, who is no slouch in terms of the NBA re- or NBA NHL resume itself. You can't I'm even play the draft basketball. On that one, I'm all man. over the map, man. <laughs> uh, but you know, Derek plant, good name to have behind you. And you know, that, that is pretty obvious with his younger brother, Max as well, who's another UMD commit, but down the road, he's, he's in U 17s right now. So, um, but yeah, Zem, I think is, is going to be finding a, a pretty solid space on this team, um, and helping them shift to the more offensive focused side, um, and controlling the puck, which is a big one for UMD, um, moving forward. Love um, it. but yeah, at, adding to that, um, Matthew Perkins is the only other forward that's coming in this year. Um, but those were all the, the young guys that were, that were previously signed. One of the ones that I was really surprised in was the um, transfer portal get of Connor McNamin. Man, I'm going to have to look at the spelling. Menemony. That's, I I legitimately wanted to say that when I saw this come across the first time. (laughs) But like, you know, you don't often hear about guys going from the Big Ten to the NCHC. It's usually the other way around, specifically like Isaac Howard and some of these other people that, that went to go be more offensive. Um, you do see a little bit more from the CCHA and NCHC switching around. Um, if you're an older person from one of these, we'll just say Minnesota State. Hey, um, now, the old guys <laughs> are going to start going to Wisconsin too. I know. I know they will. But you're, you're not used to seeing the guy go from Penn State like him to UMD, especially a, a forward. Like you're you're signing up to play a different style or – umd is signing up somebody to bring in a different style maybe that's the case it would be you know shocking maybe not shocking it would be surprising sandalin is changing style (laughs) i don't think sandalin's changing styles exactly like it would would be pretty surprising (laughs) if you're going to bring one guy in and change the culture and style of play that's been so (laughs) successful for you for over a decade probably pretty one one bad year minnesota gut check you you change everything because one year went wrong yeah 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 uh but he had he had Nine assists, 15 goals, 24 points last year for him. Like, it, he's no slouch. If you're putting that on UMD, he's immediately, like, third on the list in terms of points. Maybe higher. I, I again, would have to check. Um, but he will be in the offensive notes more often than not, I would say. Maybe not 50% of the games, but more often than not, you'll see him in the offensive notes um, throughout the season. Well, I'm more excited often to than see not that. would mean 50% or higher, so. Nah. <sighs> Maybe, maybe game notes because I'll, I'll say not. he'll take a penalty on the night where he doesn't get points. Oh. He'll be in the game <laughs> notes more often than not. Then it gets double dip. <laughs> that that works. Okay, and so so what are we thinking? One more year for Shaga Bay, or what's what's the deal? Yeah, so I I actually at the state tournament this year I had wore the UMD jersey and I had a, a duct tape Shaga Bay name tag on the back there. Um, I talked to his his mom and a couple other people in the the Warroad family up there. We'll say. Um, and the conversations that they've had with UMD and the people that I know at UMD have basically said he needs to doesn't need to do much from a, a, a passing standpoint for sure or a you know a scoring standpoint. It's just a matter of growing, and that's that's any high schooler going in. It's pretty tough to make that transition. We saw Blake Beyondy struggle in his first year and then blossom a ton after that. So if you're able to get that that extra season to get a little bit more strength in your legs and put some more weight on um, in, in your core and everything else and just kind of build your stability. That does so much for you, especially in the NCHC, but in college hockey in general, like mm-hmm. it is such an advantage. And you've seen Minnesota State take advantage of this to like maybe a, a degree too far where they're letting people develop to as far as they possibly can before they bring them in. Again, maybe that changes to Wisconsin now, but <laughs> even a little bit, a little bit goes a long way. And I have, you know, no question that when Chagabe is able to come in for UMD, it's going to be an immediate impact for him as well. And that's just being, you know, closer to home and 
it, it's a little bit different because it's either UMD or UND for for the War Road Boys or the the mm-hmm. Northern Minnesota guys. And you see a couple go to Bemidji, but those are the ones that you know have a, a family tie more often than not. But oh, I thought you were him say come, the ones that aren't good enough. <laughs> no, no, no. I wouldn't do that to Bemidji. They're they're a scrappy bunch there, and you know they play their style well, but. A lot of the ones that I know, perspective, or you know, personally, I've had some sort of a family tie or history sure. or whatever with the, well, the city there. So, hang on, family tie, because you talked about it. Hey, when you when you met with Shagabe's mom at the tourney, yeah. you met the War Road family, quote unquote. I, I believe you're the one that told me. Is Shagabe not Pilgrim's uncle or something like that? Uh, yes. So that was a tough, tough pill to swallow when I saw Pilgrim sign with North Dakota. Um, this, this past season, I thought we would be able to sway him in two different letters that I read both, um, uh, Schlossman shout out. Um, and then I forgot who the other one was and I feel bad about it, but he specifically listed my choices were UND or UMD. He specifically mentioned Shagabe was going there, the family relation there. It was very, very tempting. But, you know, he's been a North Dakota fan. His family's been North Dakota fans since, I mean, he had a nice picture when he was growing up in a, 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 the Tavares a Sioux DJ. jersey at the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was, you know, I again, I can't fault the guy for it. it it's going to be great for North Dakota. I'm going to love watching him play at least once a year, fingers crossed, twice a year more often than not. Um, but, yeah, it was a tough pill to swallow to see that scoring power and just natural hockey mindset and sight go to a conference rival but happy to have shagabe love that another mr hockey um in in the pipeline there we go love it anyone else that's notable that will be coming in or do we kind of hit on the ones that are um so we hit on them it was (laughs) i was a little bit distraught at the beginning beginning or sorry end of the season knowing that UMD had no planned um, prospects to join the team on the defensive side. And then I got even more nervous when Wyatt Kaiser signed because I'm like, okay, we're losing Dashke because he's aging out and Kaiser, which were two pretty big pieces on the defensive front next year. And we're a defensive focused team, but um, we are getting a little bit of relief. And speaking of North Dakota, Luke Bast is is coming over, and he had a couple of injuries and was sitting out this year for a couple other reasons. So, uh, not a ton to go on. One assist or one goal, three assists, I think, on the season for him through five or six games. I don't remember the total number on that one either. Um, but it's another guy that's got a little bit more size and has familiarity in the conference, and you know maybe is able to give a little bit of insight to to North Dakota and how to exploit some of the stuff there um to to umd and you know i'll add a little bit of a caveat on that i don't know how much insight you're going to get when north dakota had a 50 percent turnover on their roster this year and the the only insight he can give you is how sick their rink is like that's the magic sauce right like exactly there's nothing else to take from it yeah um okay well that's fair but i i I gotta ask then because i know you want to say it i know you're sitting there on it there may or may not be a player that's not a transfer portal candidate per se but with the the departure of a uh, noteworthy (laughs) coach in the southern part of the state there is a player that you're hoping is going to come home well not only a noteworthy departure of a coach that had you know helped recruit him to uh minnesota state we'll just call it out um but his brother has a pretty good legacy his family has a pretty big legacy in duluth so aaron pionk is is a name that i have heard thrown around as somebody to watch out for you know signing as a umd bulldog and i I don't know when if or how that news would come across but i have heard that from no fewer than two dozen people and a lot of that is umd fans on hermantown all of Hermantown. No, 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 no. Not all of Hermantown. There Two was dozen, that's a okay, like half of Hermantown. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but you know, there's there's some intrigue in that outside of just the family ties and you know, coaching changes and everything else as well. He's familiar with Zam Plant, who's coming in this year as well. So if both of them can come in as you know, two more Hermantown guys playing with Biondi and everybody else that's there, um it's it's just an immediate comfortability where you don't have to kind of relearn everything you've got somebody you can grow with and build with and it's it's something that i'm 
really, really hoping for because frankly, UMD needs the help on the defensive side of the puck. And I think he has been a fantastic player, um, not only in high school, but, but in these, these junior leagues as well. Like he could come in and make an immediate impact. And I have zero doubts about it. And I hesitate to get my hopes up too much, but uh, two different people that have been right about Luke Bast coming in and the kid from Colorado College, I can't remember his name, um, not yeah, signing. Well, yeah, it, it, <laughs> they were right about both of those, have both said that Aaron Pionk is coming to UMD. And again, I'm not saying that is a fact. I'm not breaking that news. I am not putting that out there. I wouldn't do that, knocking on wood, doing everything I can here. All I'm saying is I would enjoy it very, very much, and it would help out the Bulldogs a lot. So, I mean, now that you've knocked on the wood, though, and, like, done the whole bit, like, you're covered, no jinx, like, just just give me the sound bite now. Announce it. Aaron Pionk is confirmed. He will be joining the Bulldogs. We don't know when, but it's confirmed. Hey, I, <laughs> I, I just released a blog where I said that we have to be more positive. We have to manifest the things that we want. So, I'll, I'll say it right now. Aaron Pionk, of the Pionk name and family, the illustrious group familiar with both the Duluth area and the Bulldogs specifically will be joining the UMD Bulldogs next year. Big news, big there news, people. Holy shit. Breaking now, news. Now, uh, among the great uh, families of Minnesota, starting with the letter P, I'd put them roughly second. <sighs> okay. Who's one? What? Well, you have to ask me who's number one. I want to know who you have as one. There's a player that is currently on the Blues roster who I have as one in Duluth. No, no, no. In Duluth or Minnesota? Great. Minnesota. The state okay. of Minnesota. Okay. Then I'm I'm struggling to think of it, but tell me. Well, why don't you just look over my shoulder? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Pitlick reigns supreme. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And Rhett, Rhett's going to do some big boy things next year. I think he will. I really think he will. I'm, I'm not taking that away from you. I, I think it's great. Okay, whatever. Um, all right, we have to now. Whether or not you finished your beer, I'm on to the next one, and we got to okay. give a big shout-out to our good friends at Bent Paddle. I have what uh, I have no problem saying is my favorite beer that they've done. Um, I would love to have it in the tap room fresh, but uh, the barrel-aged extra-baked stout with chocolate coconut and vanilla flavor it is incredible they always release it right around the time of my annual snowmobile trip out in up michigan and i always bring it and it's always just fucking incredible i love it so much that sounds like a fantastic winter beer and you know even a spring beer at this point like it is got it has got a lot of stuff that i love i've i've moved on personally to the lighter, more summery. I'm trying to manifest that warm weather. I want to be out there golfing. <laughs> I've moved on to those beers, but that is right up my alley for any time where I, I feel a little bit chilly and I need one of those ones. Um, talking Ben Paddle, though, I've got the Fruity Toots Sour, uh, sour mm-hmm. ale with pineapple and blackberry. Um, talking about mm-hmm. Ben Paddle specifically again as well. So um, I, I don't mean to, to cover up the, the beautiful cans here, but I got to use this koozie somehow and it lets me have the, the logo still showing there. So that's my dessert beer after I'm done with the, the cream ale. There we go. Fair enough. Delightful. Well, let, let's yeah. talk then what you already said it next year. Isn't necessarily the resurgence of UMD hockey, but you expect it to be better. Correct. What's the bar? Like, where are you placing the bar that if they finish at or above, you are content? If they finish anywhere below, you're not happy. So I'm going to start from what I would consider a failure of a season and move up from there. There you go. 500. This year, finishing below 500 killed me personally. It was the first time they were below 500 in like a maybe not a decade. I think they did once in like the 15, 16, but in a very long time. Um, and it was tough to watch. And I hated seeing that little factoid come up in a couple of different broadcasts and everything else. So failure, what I would set the bar at. Um, there's, there's two of them that I'm trying to decide between one specifically would be to get home ice 
in the NCHC playoffs for the first time. They didn't do it last year. They didn't, they, or sorry, they didn't do it this year. They didn't do it last year. Getting the home ice would be huge for UMD with all of that firepower leaving Western Michigan, with a couple of people leaving St. Cloud State. Well, hang on, um, with- I, let, let's pause quick. Would you rather, uh, this is not for the bar for success, but this is yeah. for you personally, would yeah. you rather have Duluth be the high seed, be the host against someone, or would you be happier if they were the low seed and matched up with St. Cloud? Could they be the high seed and still match up with St. Cloud? No. Nope, that's not an option. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's tough for me because I, I'm on the record as saying that I am growing tired starting to grow tired maybe not yet i'm not there yet i'm starting to grow tired of the st cloud state being the last series of the regular season for umd and part of that is because the first series of the postseason for the last two years has also been st cloud state there's just a lot of going on at the end of the year it's just like rinse and repeat i want a little bit of diversity there so for that reason only because i know st cloud state is going to be the the last game on the regular season for the bulldogs for the foreseeable future just because of travel and everything else and other agreements in place i would rather have them be the high seed and play somebody else because and again this is me outsmarting the the rest of the room here i know it's not going to be denver and so my choices are either going to be probably miami um which they're going to be the last. They're going to be the last in the NCHC again next year. Uh, there's just no, no, no two ways about it. Um, Colorado College, or I, in my opinion, probably Western Michigan. Those, those are the ones. Uh, maybe Omaha's in there as well. But okay. I would rather have them play any of those teams in the first week of the NCHC playoffs than have to play St. Cloud State again. And again, for the record. And making sure I've got this soundbite out there. It's not because I'm afraid of St. Cloud State. I'm just bored with it. That's that's all it is. Scared. Okay. I mean, you did just say that you're smarter than me, so I'm not going to take <laughs> uh, your side. <laughs> the, no, that, that's totally fair. No, most people don't. The, um, the, the second bar that I'm thinking of, because mm-hmm. if they do get home ice advantage in the NCHC playoffs, it basically, I wouldn't say it guarantees it, but it's it's pretty darn close to guaranteeing it making the NCAA tournament again. Like that's, that's where they're at as, as bad as they were this year, quote unquote, according to many people online, they finished at 23 in the pairwise 22 uh, in that, that low your or favorite, high 20s. Your favorite system in the world. The pairwise. Oh God, my, my absolute favorite. Like they, they had a lot of really bad losses that if you switch one of those around, they're sitting at 20, you switch two of those around, we're sitting at 18 and it's like, it doesn't take much for them to be in that conversation of being included in the NCAA playoffs. And then if you, like Scott Sandlin tends to do, are playing your best hockey at the end of the year, you have a good chance of winning the frozen faceoff uh, for the NCHC and then just immediately catapulting yourself and cementing one of those spots. So making it to um, the NCAA playoffs would be would be my bar. Above that, anywhere above that, even if you're the last one to get in, successful season even if you're getting in by a you know winning the the postseason after having a terrible year successful season i want to see them in in the ncaa playoffs because they're a team that no matter what their performance was throughout the the regular season they can win one of those games no doubt in my mind not saying they will but they can and so it is the bar though just getting in or like it's a four seed acceptable for you a four seed is acceptable for me for next year. Okay. You talk to me when all of these guys are juniors and another year older, when we're having this conversation next year, I'm going to tell you probably based depending on how next year goes. Well, I, I mean, that, that depends on transfer portal. It depends on yeah. guys going to the NHL. I, I would say a year from now, there is a 70% chance, maybe 75. We'll just give it to 75 because I like that oh. number more. There's a 75% chance that I'm saying, Frozen four is my level for success. And that's crazy. That's a crazy thing to do and say as a college hockey fan. But I, I would say that playoffs next year at, at any seed is is successful season for the Bulldogs. Okay. Uh, put the over-under out there for me. How long until Sandlin rolls out? Oh, so that's tough. That is, it, it could happen. 
depending on how the NHL handles their coaching situation this year, like it could happen this off season and I would be surprised, but I wouldn't be completely shocked. Like he has interviewed for at least three, if not four NHL coaching positions. And I don't know if he's gotten second interviews or how close he was in any of these, but he's got a long track record of success, not only at the college level, but at developing um, NHL ready talent. So we're seeing uh, Hextall do it up in uh, Seattle this year. College coaches Come on, dude. can, can play their players in a system that pr- like produces playoff ready teams. Like they're, they're a game up on the avalanche as we're recording this. Not that it will be that. By the time I don't disagree thing. with the stance on Seattle. The fact that you're going to say that Hackstall is the reason is bonkers to me. No, it's it's not the reason. It's the fact that they were able to take second round talent from every team in the I, NHL. I think that the Seattle Kraken players deserve a medal for carrying Hackstall as far as they have. It's so hard to tell because I know he's not a locker room guy just based on all the stories I've heard and just watching him and his persona. Like he is a stone faced, no emotion like guy. That being said, you understand where he's coming from. He's just no nonsense either. It, it's just straight facts. It'll tell you how it is and, and that's it. Some players vibe with it. Some players don't. I don't necessarily disagree with you in terms of um, what the success is up there, but that's not to say that Sandalin's going to be that much different. I wouldn't say that Sandalin is joking around with all the guys and this super jovial personality all the time either, but he gets what he needs out of the players and specifically defensive players. Like he develops them into really, really solid hockey players. And if you're in a system or a team or, you know, city that values that, I think he's a great coach and a great, great person for that. So, um, do I think it's going to happen this offseason? Absolutely not. I think we're, we're in the middle of what's going to be a, a retooling um, and a, a rebuilding. We're, we've already started that for, for UMD. Um, would I be shocked if he left in the next 10 years? No. Do I want that to happen? Absolutely not. I think he is a staple for UMD and a reason why a lot of the players come here. But um, no, it wouldn't shock me in the next decade if he's gone. Okay. Interesting. And it won't be because he's fired. I'll say that. Do you think there's a world where he gets fired ever? Um, it would take destined to walk away on his own accord. It would take f- four, if not five seasons finishing below 500. And maybe that includes this one, but that's a won't. big leash. Holy shit. I would have said like three at most. You saw Wisconsin, who is more trigger happy than, as a Big Ten school, more trigger happy than most. I mean, their coach got three years of of leash below five hundred, and yeah, but that's also not a guy that's been there forever. Like I understand the loyalty and that college hockey is different, but it's also an alumni. Like Like Sandlin, what played for UND, like. like, But it's is there a certain point where like a coach has been there too long, kind of thing, or is that not a thing in college hockey? I would say if your play style does not match what is current in the NCAA and you're playing, not to call out Bemidji specifically because it has worked for them, but they they play a trap hockey game. They have forever, they will forever. Like I just don't understand how they get away from it because it allows them to compete with teams who have way more talent than them and win those hockey games. We saw it when they beat Cole Caulfield in the playoffs. Like it was largely due to that trap system and a few bigger, a few, a couple more bigger bodies than, than that Wisconsin team had. So that that is the happiest, a non gopher win has ever made me in the college hockey tournament. I I can understand it. Freaking out. That was so fun. Yeah. So like, if if you run and you're you're sticking to a trap system or a different system that just isn't working for your conference and you're just stubborn and forcing it down the throats of the players, it doesn't fit the style of the players you're bringing in. Yes, I think that that is something that would get you fired probably sooner rather than later. But mm-hmm. it's working for Bemidji. Like I said, I'm not calling them out. That's just the one that comes to mind as this is the school I'm familiar with that plays a specific style over and over again. Um, and I, I don't necessarily think UMD relies on that. They do play a more defensive style and, and you know, uh, they focus on it, but they rely on offensive defensemen. You saw it with 
Perunovic and everybody wants the next Perunovic to come in. But when he was here, like we were a force to be reckoned with. And so everybody wanted Derek Dashke to be that last year. And it's tough to see it not happen, but those are massive, massive shoes to fill, at least in the college realm. So mm-hmm. um, I would say that if you're playing a style that isn't conducive to winning and you're sticking to it, no matter what, yeah, that, that, that is a recipe for disaster as a coach. Fair. And before we close out with a couple of minutes of just pumping the breweries of Duluth, Anything yep. else you wanted to hit on? Anything we missed from this past season, this upcoming season? Anything UMD Bulldogs? Yes, there are two things related to the same topic, and that's goaltending. Um, <laughs> one, the Edmonton Oilers are moronic. Uh, the organization is a joke. The fact that they're trotting out Skinner for a playoff team that hosts uh, two of the top five scorers, we'll say, probably two of the top three scorers in, uh, in the NHL. I have 100 point scorers this year. Or yeah. Three, like three, three. When them. you have that and you're just like stuck in your ways of not yielding that your goalies are playing less than expected and unwilling to just risk it and bring up some younger talent and burn those contracts while you've got those offensive powers there, you're stupid. And that is me to say, Ryan Fanti should be playing up there. And I know he's two steps down. He's playing for the, the Comets in God knows where in middle America right now. Mm-hmm. But I, <laughs> the stats that he's put up, he just had a shutout uh, recently. I don't know if it was two days ago now. By the time you're listening to this, it was well over a week ago. But he's scored goals as a goalie this year. He has dominated the, the fighting game as a goalie this year. He injects a level of energy into games that you're not going to find with some of these other guys. And maybe that's because they're downtrodden and they're losing games despite the fact of scoring five goals out there. Um, but I would love to see him get a, a really fair shot. And I, I, I hate to say it, Veach. This sounds an awful lot like a former Edmonton Oiler goalie, Mike <laughs> Smith. Is that in his favor or not? Um... I'll let you decide that one on your own. Like I, I, I don't have an answer for you on that. Uh, we'll, we'll plead the fifth. But while we're on the topic of, of UMD goalies that have performed incredibly and signed pro contracts and just never been given a shot, there's a kid sitting out in Hershey, Pennsylvania in the Washington organization right now, Hunter Shepard, that just no matter what he does, the numbers he puts up, he's just – Un- unable to to break onto that roster and it's infuriating to see because he's somebody that is in my opinion captain clutch and that's not because he's a northern minnesota guy it's not because he played for umd it's a little bit of both of those it's the fact that he he never lost a playoff game at duluth like when the time comes he wins you hockey games and it's just got that that it factor the intangibles that just you're not going to see it in the minor leagues, despite how many news clippings they want to put out there. You only witness it at the biggest stages and I I want the best for him. So those two goalies need to go up. Those were one point of my two separate points of the larger group that we're talking about. Do do they have, do they have a YouTube video yet though? (laughs) Uh, They do not have a a Daylock super fan esque video, which might be the reason why that that could be why maybe I I have to do that. I would love, you know, it is a a white whale podcast dream of mine to sit down with both of them across the table and just hear stories. Like I just want them to tell me stories and just talk UMD and oh, you you missed the boat there, Beach. No, my white whale is I want to get the four beauties and and Rubbermaid all to come <laughs> on a podcast with us and just talk about how the fuck they came up with this shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That would be great. If we can find one of them, they are an instant book. They can pick any day, any time we will record with them. It would be a delight. Uh, I promise you I can find one of them. Find Promise. One. Do it. You just promised. Do it. Um, point two regarding UMD goaltending is, and I'm not questioning Sandlin. He's obviously much smarter than I am. I don't understand how you leave Adam Guyon off of your roster for next year. We're talking about 
a, a Slovak goaltender who was <laughs> the shining beacon of like goaltending ability and skill and everything at the world juniors last year, he was stealing games. He was keeping that team in games. They had no right to be in. And he hasn't broken onto this roster yet. We're keeping um, stay skull who by all, you know, rights as a freshman played out of his mind. He was injured and dealing with testicular cancer last year and a few injuries this year and had some shining moments. So I can understand the loyalty there. But we've got Matthew Thiessen coming back as well that, again, not super mad at. He played well enough this year. Neither of them are 900-plus save goaltenders. Neither of them are allowing two or less goals per game, at least not last year uh, or not this year. So I would love to see Guyon have his opportunity come. That being said, uh, I am nervous about him being another one-and-done goaltender for UMD just because we've been burned by that in the past. So um, I would love for him to come in if he's going to be a one-and-done when this team is largely juniors and more skilled players and can keep compete physically. So maybe that is the, the logical reasoning that I've kind of deduced through the last five minutes of talking to myself here. But it was surprising to me to see him not coming in um, next season. Dude, I talk myself in circles like that all the time. I'm still yeah. convinced that the only reason that Dean Evison's being a douchebag and not playing Kalen Addison is that he doesn't want him to be uh, uh, offer sheet eligible. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I thought he was offer sheet eligible. I don't think he is. I don't think he I don't know. I th- it's I probably was... pretty close. I know Gus I thought is there eligible. Was... Two people, Gustafson and Addison, that were eligible for offer sheets next year. Well, then he just benched him and told everyone that he sucks, so that no one will offer sheet him. Yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, I, how many offer sheets did we see this this past season? There weren't many. Not enough. Well, I think it is an underused tool, but you are kind of breaking that coach, you know, code of conduct. And I don't uh, know, dude. It it seems to me that Montreal and Carolina love using them. So. Those are the two franchises. You're absolutely right. We need, we need more of it. And it's paid off for Carolina. Like they've, they've absolutely benefited from it, but I mean, Montreal, what have they done with it? They had w- one season where they <laughs> played out of their minds due to some goaltending and lucky bounces. Hey, you know what though? Like the French are assholes, but if Marty's behind their bench, I can't hate. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's totally fair. I mean, he is a, a staple and, the way that he's built physically boggles my mind every time I see it. I don't know who makes his suits, but they get paid extra for the, the crazy dimensions of legs and short. And I was just... going to say, dude, the, the tailor of those pants must yeah. have their work cut out for him. That's brilliant oh, yeah. work. Yeah. I, I wonder if he gets measured like right after a leg day when they're pumped, just so he knows he's got a little bit extra room just in case. That, I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, the only other thing I want to touch on is is injuries uh, for UMD because that seems like it's plagued them the last two years in a row. For what it's worth, on the offensive side, they only had four players play every single game this year. On the defensive side, that was even worse. They only had three players play every single game this year. Part of that, at least to a couple of the players, was due to ejections, and you know, I'm not going to fault that to injuries and everything else, but. A lot of a lot of their team has been just mixed around and shuffled, and there was the lack of consistency could have very well been due to the lack of consistency in the lineup as well. So if you're always playing with somebody different, it's really hard to build that chemistry. So I would like to see a season. You can't expect that a team is going to go injury free for a season. That's kind of crazy, but just to have something that's a little bit more manageable or not all at once or whatever it might be. And, you know, I wish that for everybody in college hockey for, for what it's worth. I, I, I want everybody that's that's earned a right to be there to be able to play every game. But UMD has had it specific, or particularly rough the last couple of seasons, and I would like to see them have, have their guys um, available to play. Blake Biondi specifically, he was their leading scorer last year. This year got cut short in, like, December. So having him back is, is only going to help as well. Reasonable request. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, then uh, we got to end it then. We already pumped the tires of Ursa Minor, who has yet yep. to talk to me, but uh, shout out, guys. I would love to be friends. Um, we talked Bent Paddle, who 
just awesome people, awesome tap room, awesome beer. Yep. Uh, you guys can check out. We've got interview content. We've got brewery tours, whatever, on our YouTube channel, SodaPod yep. YouTube channel. Uh, same with Castle Danger, who, although Veach uh, isn't a big fan of driving, doesn't go up there as often as he'd like. Great beer, as he said. Great beer. Tap room as well. Very different yep. vibe. Um, any others, though, in the greater Duluth area that you want to highlight? Um, so there's there's quite a few. I, I want to shout out one of the distilleries or the distillery there as well. Vikra, Vikre. I don't know how you actually pronounce it. I see I it three Vikra. different ways. And when I go to the, the, the distillery or the distillery itself there, I've heard it two different ways there. And one of them was from a new person. So I tend to trust the other one. But <laughs> they, they make... If you're a gin fan, they make three different gins there. Their juniper gin is one of my absolute favorites. The cedar, if you're going to make any smoked gin cocktails, which are few and far between for me. But those two are my, my top two for sure. And then spruce is just like you like extra piney gin. Gin's already piney. It's just extra. So um, if you're going to make a gin Bloody Mary, that's the one I would use. I just don't tend to buy that. It's a gin vodka. Bloody Mary. Oh, yeah. I've never Bloody heard Maria of is with tequila. A gin Bloody Mary, I have yet to come up with a name with it. I'm sure somebody else already has. But uh, a lot of people I know are, are making gin Bloody Marys just because it's got a lot more herbal notes to it already that you're adding to spices. It's like a, a, a craft, craft cocktail. So um, This is news to me. I have not heard of this. this oh, is, yeah. Uh, um, oh. I would say try it. I, I would, you know, maybe get it in a bar before you commit to a full bottle of it. But um, it's it's worth a shot. Um Another brewery, uh, Blacklist. I've, I've got another beer here. Um, I think this is just another golden ale, uh, but specifically, God, I'm trying to figure out how to send this. It's just called Duluth. It's a Duluth golden ale. It's it's super simple. I love it because it's in Hermantown colors. So, you know, I, I was an immediate purchase for me. Uh, great summer beer. Like I said, I'm already on to the, the summer stuff here. Um, but Blacklist, they, I think, moved right next door to where they originally had, had lined up there. Big garage door, good atmosphere. It's a bit of a longer, longer, skinnier bar vibe, but that's what you get in Duluth with a lot of the buildings that are there. They've got axe throwing in the back, tons of events. Um, I don't know. I, I, I love it. It's it's good stuff there. Um, the two that we've already talked about, I, I was just at both those tap rooms. I was actually at the Cannon Lounge for Bent Paddle um, last weekend, and it was a good spot to go check out if you're more into the THC or CBD waters. Um, awesome, awesome spot. It was got this really cool plant seventies vibe. This, this chair that I'm in currently right now would fit the motif there. They're quite well. Veach, we are going to go to Bent Paddle. We're going to yep. go to the cannabis lounge or whatever you call it. Canna lounge. Yep. And we are going to just do, we're going to get our rotating camera in the middle and we're just going <laughs> to do the circle from that 70s show. Uh, hey, that would go over so well with me, and I think they would love the promotion there. And it's there's a there's one specific spot that I'm thinking of that would work great because they've got uh, two seaters on two sides and then a chair on each end, and it would be a awesome, awesome place to sit down and do a podcast interview, whatever you want to do. There. I am a sucker for that '70s show, so yes, yep. this just yep. sounds perfect. 100%. That, that is something that I would recommend, not only for us, but for everybody else to go check out as well. It's actually in their, their old tap room in the facility where they're doing a lot of the canning there. Um, but it's it's a great spot. I uh, highly recommend that one as well. I, I would just go full into like Phil Kessel and then I'd flip into the uh, the, <laughs> the Harry Carey SNL skits. And yeah, I yeah. would just be like, if Phil Kessel was a hot dog and he was starving, <laughs> would he eat himself? I know I would. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, son of a bitch. Okay. So Any other? There's, there's one specific one, and we've had a little bit of back and forth with this as well as, <laughs> as some others pointed Over out the water? online. Over the water? <laughs> it's, it's not a Duluth brewery <laughs> as much as I claim it to be. It's got Duluth vibes, oh. but yes, it is in Superior, but they make fantastic beer. I would, If you see it in the store, get it, especially if you haven't had it, try it. Um, the stuff that you can get in the tap room is, is even better in my opinion, just cause they have a couple more variations of, they don't, they don't bother canning, but earth rider is absolutely awesome. They, they, I think 
if you Google Earthrider, they might bring you to their uh, brewing or whatever facility. You may have to Google You'll the Cedar Lounge. Out. They're right by each other. You'll think. Yeah, out. but it's it's Earthrider. I think at the Cedar Lounge, or if you Google one or the other, like it'll bring you there close enough. Yeah. Live music in the summer. They've got a, a really good um, open air patio lawn space. Um, everything about it i love it like oh, dude, I, love I don't the dive bar venture. feel i like yes. even inside they've got the whole stage for live performances the yep. beer is great and uh, apologies i didn't mean to out you in front of everyone when you said that you were celebrating in duluth after a duluth win <laughs> no 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 worries there and you know uh, now that we're talking about some some dive bars and everything else if you're a Grateful Dead fan, there's only one spot to go, or a fan of liquor. If you're if you're not a beer person, which would be crazy if you're watching this, maybe maybe not, but like just based on the beer sponsors and everything, the Ripple Bar. It's not a brewery. It's not a distillery. They don't make anything there. But the Ripple Bar has immaculate vibes. It's connected to Hoops, right right in Duluth. There, it's right next oh, to the arena. So it's it's a very small, cozy vibe. You're, it's connected talking, to like, Hoops. I didn't even it, notice it's it. Connected yeah. to Hoops. It's like a knee wall that's separating it. Um, Which, yeah, you didn't even mention hoops, but that place is just hopping. Yeah, it's it's packed. If you're going to a UMD Bulldogs game and you're looking for a spot last minute right before, that's a quick, easy walk over. That's the spot to go. Um, you're going to find me across the wall in the Ripple um, just because they've got the best cocktails I've had in Duluth there. But yeah, the vibe those is, gin is bloodies, also awesome right? as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the well, the so Dark and Stormies they make there, not that it's a – crazy you know complicated cocktail like you have to just have yeah. uh gosling's rum lime and and the gosling ginger beer but the best ones i've ever had are there they make some specialty drinks there they've got uh you know if you're looking for a cheaper beer option they've got the beer in a bump or a bucket of blats it's just beer in a, a dive bump bar. is a way to go oh man. god for six bucks you're gonna get a beer and a, a shot of you know bourbon i think they serve there but or a rye but Dude, i dinged myself up bad off those in Mecca. uptown oh yep. my god they had it at uh what is it it's uh uptown is it uptown tap maybe uptown tavern know. no not tavern because it's the one that's on uh Pat's tap? No, no, no. It's I'm pretty sh- Lindale tap, maybe. Oh, uh, that Tavern, could be something yeah. like that. Really good food, but uh, they did that one day, and we had to go there because my buddy had moved out of our place, and me and a different buddy wanted to go watch Penguins versus Flyers. And yeah. later that night was my wife's uh, like moving out party because we had bought a house. Well, I guess girlfriend at the time. Whatever details. Nah. And we went there and did several beer in a bumps while playing darts and watching hockey. Then her roommate proceeds to send us to, uh, I think it's Sushi Tango is what it was in Uptown. Oh, sure. Because they had this happy hour. And we show up there and like we've never really like ordered sake before. So we're like, oh, they have a $5 sake special. Cool. We'll each <laughs> take one. Both of us got a fucking pitcher of hot sake for five bucks. We were buckled. I got in so much trouble. Because all her request was is that we like be somewhat under control when <laughs> we show up. Well, we went from there and went to Uptown Tavern and whatever it is, Cowboy Slims, I think is what it was called. Oh, it was, and, yeah. And to watch, it was one of the uh, Gopher Michigan Big Ten Championships. And we're like, I don't even remember getting to her place. And <laughs> we were just in so much trouble. But all that to say, beer in a bump is a glorious thing. But We've said several last thing, last things, but yeah, the real yeah, yeah. last thing, do they have Duluth beer for sale at Amsoil? They do. They do, in fact, have Duluth beer for sale. Mm-hmm. In fact, they've got a Hoops specialty beer that they brew specifically for the arena only. You can only get it at Amsoil there, especially what kind of beer? Can, everything. Uh, I would have to look at that again. But if I were to guess, it's probably on the lighter side, Pilsner Lager, uh, maybe a Pale Ale. Something that's a, a, a crowd pleaser that's there. But Bent Paddle has beer there as well. Um, and I think Earthrider, the the blue can, which I'm struggling to remember which one it is. Hell yeah. Uh, but those are the ones I, I tend to see there more often than not. But yes, they do have beer at Amzo, which is, I'm surprised more places don't. But it's actually a, a semi-reasonable price compared to, you know, I, I live in the cities now. But like the city's prices for beers at any venue. So it's a good spot. What a beautiful note to end on. That That is very uplifting. Yes. Oh. Well, thank you, as always, Veach. Uh, all of you know we got two more of these to come in the coming weeks. 
until then, we're signing off here, and uh, you'll probably hear from Veach one or two more times here this summer. We'll see how many times he raises his hand. But, uh, <laughs> man, we, we get here? Yeah, whenever you need me, I'm, I'm raising my hand. I'll be around. Unless I'm, like, out on the boat for a, a weekend or on vacation. Yeah, if you're, if you're out on the I'm boat, yours. that's – yeah, no one comes back from the boat for podcast. Yeah. That'd be stupid. Yeah. I'm yours otherwise. Beauty. Well, everyone, check him out at Veni Vidi Veach. I love the handle. I've already told you your uh, picture throws me for a loop just because I message both you and Waggle, and they look oh too similar. So hey, really that's that good company to be compared with. If, <laughs> if I'm going to be confused with anybody, <laughs> love the people over there. Waggle makes incredible stuff. Hat on, hat over there. That's the only ones I wear now. It's the most comfortable. I, I, we're giving them, you know, potentially free advertising right now, but I'm happy to do it. Oh, I, hey, I no, love not free that. advertising. They're our best friends. And anyone that goes to getyourwagalon.com, use promo code SP10. That's for Sota Pod 10. Get 10% off. Full order, Perfect. but it's one time use. So you better load up the cart. Load it up. It's totally worth it.